Hi everyone, uh, this is Russ White and I'm here with the History of Networking videocast from the Network Collective. And we're starting a new series where we're just going to sit around with people who helped invent the internet. That sounds so impressive, doesn't it? Helped invent the internet. And we're going to talk to them about what they did and the role they played and stuff like that. And uh, I think we'll just start by going around the round table. And I see Donald all the way on my right hand side. So I'll start with Donald Sharp over there. I'm Donald Sharp. And I, um, I currently help manage the uh, open source uh, routing product, uh, routing suite called Free Range Routing. And Yvonne, you're sitting over there looking all, you're not glowing anymore. That's, well, that's good. Uh, I'm Yvonne <laughs> Sharp. I'm a network ar architect for a large uh, healthcare enterprise and one of the co-founders of Network Collective and excited to be here today. I'm listening more than contributing for sure. <laughs> <laughs> and Fred, we have Fred Baker, who is a well-known past chair of the IETF and all around good guy. Actually, I'll tell you something very personal. Fred Baker actually helped convince me to homeschool my kids. So there you go, Fred. Mm. <laughs> well, my wife is the one who gets the blame for doing it, but, uh, you know, it was a good thing. Yeah, it was. So tell us what you're doing, Fred, and a little bit about yourself, maybe. What am I doing? Well, after 22 years at Cisco, I'm no longer there. Uh, right now I'm consulting and working with the Internet Software Consortium and the Internet Society and a few other people. Okay. Um, basically trying to keep the ball rolling forward. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm basically having fun. So. <laughs> I wish right, we all great. could do that. I do too. Right. <laughs> that would be a lot of fun to do, right? All right. Well, cool. Good. So I think we're talking about quality of service today, right, Fred? So right. maybe you could just kick right. off and start talking, and then we'll try to interrupt you as much as as much as we can. <laughs> okay, sure. Um, so I'm going to kind of tell a story which is much bigger than me. I'll tell you where I fit into various parts of it. But um, uh, frankly, there's been a lot of people who have done a lot of work and to not recognize them would be a travesty. So I'm going to bring up some people that have made important contributions to um, making the internet work well for applications that use it. Um, let me start the story in, um, let's see here, where is this? There we go. Uh, let me start the story with a fellow who was later a professor at Stanford University, uh, but at this particular point in time was working at Philco Ford as an IT guy. And he had a problem. His name is John Nagel, and his problem was that terminal servers running in his network and using TCP had a bad habit of locking up the network. Uh, he could get other terminal servers that uh, were much more efficient in their use of bandwidth and he was asking, so what's with this internet technology? What's the problem? Uh, and he discovered, uh, after some cogitation, that his fundamental problem was that he was, every time his terminal server sent a character from here to there, wherever here and there might happen to be, it was sending with it a TCP header and an IP header and an ethernet header and you know, all of that stuff. So to get one character across the network to his servers, he had to uh, actually send 64 bytes, um, which is a lot. And he said, well, gee, you know, is there any way that I could get two bytes into the same TCP header? And he came up with an algorithm, which we know today as TCP's Nagel algorithm, documented it in RFC 896, and said, I've solved it. You know, we now have better quality service, in the internet, everything works well. 
Um, hey Fred, since, since you're screen sharing this, a lot of people don't actually understand the RFC series and how these things actually work. Like, what does it mean that it's historic, and what does it mean it's been obsoleted, and how old is 896? What's the first RFC number, and what was the first RFC? When was it published? Do you know? I mean, off the top of your head, you might not know. I don't know. So yeah, well, the first RFC in the series was uh, one. And wow. Wait, how creative. How creative. Come on. <laughs> um, we didn't start counting at zero. I, I'm a little I disappointed that we didn't start counting at zero. <laughs> we didn't start counting at zero. We should have, but, you know, in, in 2020 hindsight. Uh, okay, <laughs> so the author of this RFC was a fellow by the name of Steve Crocker, who right now is the chairman of the board of ICANN. Uh, has been a security researcher, has done a vast number of things in the internet since then. And he came up with the RFC series. And the question was, in essence, how can we get, um, get people to talk with each other about this, uh, what do you call it, internet thing that we're in the process of creating? And he wanted to fly under radar. He wanted to... Um, uh, not make this appear to be, you know, these are the specifications for the entire future of communications. But this is a bunch of friends talking with each other. So rather than calling them requirements for compliance, which vendors later did call them, um, he called them requests for comments. And is literally just uh, let's put up a document and let people throw mud at it. Um, over the, that, so that started, and you can see here that the, the first one is published set the 7th of April, 1969. Uh, not the 1st of April. We've certainly had our share of those, like IP on avian carriers and so on and so forth. Um, but, uh, so this is the first RFC. Now, the RFC series contains a little bit of everything. If you go to CCIGT, to ITU, to Etsy, to IEEE, to each of the various standards development organizations that are around, they focus very much on standards. Here, we're going to write a paper that tells you what to do. Um, it doesn't usually tell you why, it tells you what. And um, so this is a point of confusion. At some point, we should do a show on how to read an RFC, you mind, but. Yeah, that, that's, okay. that should. Anyhow, um, so the RFC series, we've got the good and the bad and the ugly. Uh, experiments that people tried that failed. Experiments they tried that succeeded. Thoughts that they had, and I'm gonna bring up a, just a white paper a little bit later, actually a couple of them that turned out to be seminal in the development of quality of service technology. Um, the fact that uh, uh, RFC 896 is historic basically means that um, it's been obsoleted. Uh, so RFC 7805, if, uh, it, let's hear, let's, let's pull that one up. Um, who decides what the next number is? Uh, the RFC editor, who at the, <laughs> at the moment is Heather Flanagan. Um, used to be do, done. Do you, no. want, do you want that job, Donald? No. Is that what you're saying? No. <laughs> yeah. uh, okay, so uh, there's, uh, anyhow, so uh, they have various statuses that's described in RFC 2026, and, you know, it moves along. But let me move forward with this story. Yeah, that's fine. So, this story is great. Yeah, so I just John wanted to give work, people background. Yeah. Yeah, so, so John is working on this problem in his network of my terminal servers are having problems talking with their, their servers. And he comes up with a creative solution that actually worked very well for his purposes, but didn't solve the world's problems. Now, a year later, he's still working at Philco Ford, and he's thinking about a problem that people talked about a lot in the internet, which was that, oh gee, uh, internet routers have almost no memory. Uh, a common internet router at the time was called a fuzzball. It was an LSI 1123 and a, a dinky amount of memory. Uh, it had a grand total of eight buffers. Eight, count them, 576 byte buffers. And it connected uh, a LAP-B interface uh, using a Western digital chip to an ethernet. 
That was what it did. Um, so, so, yeah. so it's entertaining to interject at this point that the internet often runs into situations where everyone thinks the whole thing is going to fall apart. We just can't make it past this, whatever this is. There's a long history of these types of things in the internet. And however, some, somewhere or another, somebody always comes up with a way of solving these problems like what John Nagel is doing right here. Right. Okay. So now the problem that he was dealing with was uh, we've got almost no memory in the routers. And we have this operating system, which is called BSD 4.1, that had a bug. And the bug was that it would um, it would do something called silly window syndrome. It would send instead of a few large packets, it would send a long stream of little tiny packets, and chew up a lot of bandwidth in the process of doing that. And so now John is thinking about this thing and saying, "Hey, what are we going to do about that?" And um, of course, the, the common comment is, you know, if only memory were cheap and I could put more memory in the routers, then memory would solve the problem. And he <laughs> said, okay, let, let's imagine just for fun that our routers now have an infinite amount of memory. What happens next? Mm -hmm. And he, he realized, uh, now at the time, the time to live field in an IP header was measured in seconds, not hops. And so if a packet sat in queue for longer than a second, it was supposed to decrement TTL by more than one. Um, and John, John realized that, well, gee, suppose we've got somebody in silly window syndrome and we fill up the queues really, really deep. We've got more than 15 seconds worth of traffic, which that being a magic number at the time. What we would now have is a scenario in which the line between two routers is 100% utilized, but because packets are being dropped at the far end, we have zero throughput. And he, he gave it a name. He called it congestive collapse. He said, you know, this, this could happen. And he made a just a, a hand wavy proposal and said, you know, suppose that we divided the packets into queues based on their source address. And uh, so, so basically each session that's going on at a time would get a roughly equal amount of bandwidth out of the line. You know, if I've got one system that is doing something really, really stupid, they basically only hurt themselves. Um, wouldn't that be interesting? This paper turned out to be very seminal. Uh, and there was a lot of research that was done at that time um, and we're starting at that time on quality of service uh, in, in the research houses in various universities and other places as well. Now, that problem of congestive collapse actually happened in the ARPANET in 1987 and 1988. Uh, one thing that I got involved with, I was working at Vitalink at the time, and a fellow by the name of Neil Bierbaum at uh, Ames Research Center uh, in, in the Bay Area came over to us and, and asked me if I could make a little tweak so that he could identify one class of packets, uh, file transfer packets, and everything else, and be able to send everything else across the internet, but the uh, specifically the FTP packets, be able to send them across a satellite link to Langley in Virginia. And so he experimented with that and okay, there were some interesting results and he did whatever he did. Um, Van Jacobson was at the time a, a researcher. I think he was working on his PhD or had recently completed it. And uh, he started playing with, well, the real problem appears to be TCP in that TCP will get just a whole lot of packets out there and fill up the world and, and that's a bad thing. So let's not do that. Uh, so he came up with what has been called the Van Jacobson algorithms for transmission control and uh, taught TCP to uh, conform itself to the world that it finds itself in. Now, those algorithms have gone a long way since then, and he's been a major contributor to them. But uh, he, he started with a, uh, I think it was a SIGCOM paper in 1988 and uh, proceeded from there. Uh, so, so that is a very important contribution to this entire concept of 
quality of service. Now, is this is this slow start? Is that what this is? This is slow start and Nagel and what else? I mean, what other algorithm is in well, this? Well, not, not so much Nagel. Um, Nagel was there. That's an algorithm. But if you were running across the T1 or 56 kilobit or uh, later T3 uh, NSF net backbone, you wouldn't want to have one packet outstanding at a time. Okay, so Nag Nagel's windowing was, windowing was one packet at a time, right? It was a window size of one. Van Jacobson actually did the concept of having multiple packets outstanding. Is that correct, or is that later on? No, no. TCP from the beginning could have multiple packets outstanding. You could have a what, window more than one. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so, so what Nagel did, what the Nagel algorithm is, is it tries to have at most one packet outstanding, and when it sends a packet, to have as much data in there as possible. Um, so the... Uh, it, it, if I'm on a terminal server, I get a yeah. byte and it needs to go to the other place. I hand it to TCP. TCP says, oh, I have nothing outstanding. Fire away and send a packet containing that one byte. But it now puts the TCP connection in a state that says, I've got a packet outstanding. So now the, the terminal, I don't know, it, it might give me a whole lot of bytes. And I say, okay, I'm going to hold those. I'm going to fill up a packet um, and should the packet actually go over the maximum segment size, I'll go ahead and send that packet too. But uh, usually uh, okay. for, for terminal service, no, it'll, it'll never do that. So basically we wait until we get a, an acknowledge, a response from the, the other end, or we have to retransmit. And then we send everything that's in the buffer, just send the whole thing out. Uh, yeah. So typically, I have one packet outstanding, and I'm using it as efficiently as I can for the data that's going on. Now, what Van did, he said, let's ori originally, at the start of a TCP session, set the window size to one, and provide a mechanism to increase it over time, okay. uh, until I see that I'm actually filling up the capacity between me and the other end. Right. How do I detect that? loss. If, if right. a packet gets lost, so, I say, so this oh. is So this is a version of, earlier version of slow start, which is then followed by speedy and other things like that, which are, are used today. Yeah. Yeah, pretty much. Um, so that, that started with Van's 1988 SIGCOM paper, okay. and which he tested out in the NSF net. Um, and like I say, this is important for quality of service. It's dealing with TCP quality. In 1988, almost all traffic on the internet used TCP. That's, that's not true now, but it was true at the time. Okay. Yeah. Now, personally, where I was at in 1987, I was at Vitalink and was working on what, what today we would call an ethernet switch. And I had a customer called Texas Instruments in the Dallas Plano area. And they had, um, multiple lines interconnecting their various buildings and you know they were doing whatever it was they were doing. Most of what they did was terminal service. They had Ungerman Bass terminal servers that would talk to, you know, whatever it was that they needed to talk with. And one group or a few groups within Texas Instruments started buying these brand new systems. They were called Sun Workstations. I, I don't know if you're familiar with the title. Um, <laughs> they, they were running this operating system called Unix that nobody knew anything about. Yeah. <laughs> Unix. That's great. Unix. Yeah. <laughs> Unix. Yeah. Unix, of course. Um, and, and they would send files around. They would, and every time the Sun Workstations did something, all the terminal servers would hiccup, fall over, and die. Life was just terrible. And, you know, please, Fred, could we figure out a way to make that not happen? And, well, and, and this is literally the customer calling me. We had a good deal. So, so, yeah, I mean, the easy way to make that stop happening is to take the terminal servers off the network. But, hey, you know. <laughs> no, I don't think that was happening at Texas Insulin. But, okay, so, so I came up with a fairly simple filter, uh, knowing, I mean, I'm literally, I'm working off the top of my head. There's very little research on the topic at this point and nothing to look at. And I said, well, okay, most of the traffic that you send is small packets. 
terminal servers send usually small packets. Uh, when Sun workstations get blazing away, they send big packets. Suppose that we filter between small packets and big packets and give small packets priority. Uh, so, so, you know, the big packets get to use all the bandwidth that, that they want to use, but the terminal servers have priority. And, okay, they tried that. That worked for them. They actually ran that way for quite a number of years. Um, and now I'm kind of looking at all this and, and thinking about not just Texas Instruments, but a variety of sensors, and saying, okay, uh, there's got to be a better solution than that. You know, what, what I've just described is a complete hack. There, there's got to be a better way. And I read in 1989 in SIGCOM a paper on something called fair queuing, um, which actually now looking at it, there had been a couple of papers before then, but this was the one that caught my attention. And is like, oh, okay. If I can put this kind of an algorithm into the the uh, in in this case an Ethernet switch, um, then every session will get a certain amount of capacity, and the terminal servers will get what they need, and the the uh, the Sun workstations will get what they need, and everybody will be happy. Uh, I tried to convince my boss to do that, and he wasn't interested. Uh, I changed companies, not because of that, but I did change companies. And at my new company, uh, that was one of the first things I did was I rammed this algorithm in there um, and had an amusing response from um, what turned out to be Jeff Houston and Charles, uh, Charles Smith in Australia. They were working on a network that was uh, 48 kilobit backbone, 19.2 and 19.6 into various sites. And um, they, they sent out the diskette with this new algorithm on it to a beta site. And Charles, being the network operator, said, well, I'm not going to get in any more trouble from my users uh, for doing this than I'm already in because they all hate me. And uh, okay, I mean, some things never change. Is that what I'm hearing? Some things never change. <laughs> And so, so the, he just went around, flew around the country, rammed this diskette into the various machines, rebooted them, and he got back to uh, Canberra. Uh, then Discats. he's Discats. now talking to Jeff Houston, problem. who is one of the users of this network. And Jeff tells him, um, I don't know what you broke, but don't fix it. The network works now. Um, and the difference was fair queuing. Um, so when I came to Cisco in 1994, they asked me to do the same thing. And okay, we put fair queuing into the system, um, and, and you know things move on. And but, this, is, okay. this is prior to weighted fair queuing or anything like that. Well, so so, so weighted fair queuing. Yeah. This is the difference between industry and research. When I talk with research, research wants to make everything perfectly fair, perfect, per perfectly equal. Everybody gets exactly the same thing out of the network, whatever that thing might be. When I talk to industry, uh, and, and here I'm quoting a customer, he says, I want predictable unfairness. I want to be able to take this class of traffic and give it a certain amount of bandwidth and this other class of traffic, give it a certain amount of bandwidth or give it priority or make it go away. Or, you know, I, I want to do something different for different classes of traffic. Um, so the weighted fair queuing algorithm, or well, the, the fair queuing algorithm basically says, let's give everybody an equal share. The weighted fair queuing algorithm says, let's insert a weight on each class of traffic so that some get more than others. Um, they're essentially the same algorithm. They're just a, a vector of right. weight. You just, you just wait where you pull things off the queue instead yeah. of just allowing it. And to um, so the way I implemented it, both at ACC and at Cisco, I actually keyed off the uh, precedence field in, in the toss byte, saying, well, if it's high precedence, then let's give it more, more bandwidth than if it had low precedence. Um, but yeah, that, that's just a question of the weights in the, uh, the equation. Right. Okay. So who gets to assign the precedence? Me. Next question. 
Fred goes around to every network in the world and assigns a precedence. Just in case you didn't know, if you see Fred sneaking into your network at night, that's what he's doing. He's at the precedence. Okay. <laughs> so now life moved forward, and we've got <laughs> the M bone and you know different people working on different things. And the question became, so what happens if I've got voice or video? How do I handle that? What, what do I deal with? Um, and so various people, Bob Braden, Dave Clark, Scott Schenker are the authors on this particular RFC, but there's a long list of people that, that actually contributed to it, uh, started talking about that concept and, uh, and described now two different classes of traffic and two different classes of application. Uh, one of them they called elastic. And that's because it'll speed up or slow down based on whatever the network environment is that it's in. It'll adapt itself to the network. The other is called real time. And uh, basically uh, voice and video at the time, but uh, would now include uh, uh, telemetry traffic and other things like that. Uh, and, and they said, okay, so let's describe those applications and talk about a network in which we can actually set aside a certain amount of bandwidth for a session or for a class of traffic and, and uh, do something of that form. Now, at the same time, we were doing something similar to that in ATM. I was going to say, histor historically, this fits into the time frame of ATM, when yeah. we thought perhaps that cell traffic rather than packet traffic would help solve these problems in a more efficient way which turned out to be a bust, but that's historically kind of the time frame that we're talking about here. Yeah, yeah, exactly that time frame. And so I got involved in this in the IETF. I wound up writing an RSVP implementation for, uh, for Cisco products. Uh, but you know, so this paper really starts the integrated services architecture where one can negotiate and set a bandwidth for a session or for a class of traffic. And so the, the protocol that was designed for that was RSVP, um, which we now use for a completely different purpose. But you know, that was the purpose at the time, was to negotiate a bandwidth for a session. One of the basic rules of protocol design is it will not be used for what you think it will be used for. It'll be used for anything it can be used for. <laughs> Pretty much. Pretty much. Okay. So now when this got out there, of course, the... Um, the ISPs all looked at it and said, well, that's an attack. You know, what idiot would ever deploy that? And um, basically refused to use it for that. But, the, the, you know, the technology is there. Um, but uh, various people were looking at alternatives and saying, so, so the concept of giving uh, certain characteristics to classes of traffic makes sense, but let's not do that one. And two that were specifically involved in that were Li Shizhang, who is now a professor at UCLA and was actually a very early researcher in internet technology and is now working on what may be one of the next generation technologies in that area. She's working on name data networking. Uh, and Van is working on content center, which is a, a related concept. But okay, so Leisha started looking at all this, and another lady by the name of Kathleen Nichols, uh, who happens to be Van Jacobson's wife, uh, started looking at this as well. And together, they wrote a document, which is now RFC 2638, in which they kind of said, okay, so we've got real-time traffic, we've got elastic traffic, and uh, we will somehow, uh, to be determined, uh, ensure that the traffic that we give precedence to um, gets some set of characteristics from the network. Now, now, I mentioned that Kathleen, Kathy, is Van Jacobson's wife. At this particular point, Van, and, and you notice he's mentioned, he, he's an author on this. Van um, was, where was he? I want to say he was at Lawrence Livermore Labs at the time. And well, he, he says he was at Cisco here, which is kind of weird, actually. Well, 
but for this experiment, I think he was at Laura. Oh, yeah, right, right, right. Yeah, okay, that makes um, sense. And where Kathy started out, she was actually at Bay Networks. They both came to Cisco by the time this came out. Oh, my goodness, Bay They Networks. became Cisco. But Kathy uh -huh. was at Bay, and Van, I think he was at Lawrence Livermore. Now, now uh, Fred, it is your fault that I'm now going to have nightmares tonight. Okay. Because you said Bay Networks. <laughs> Fred's okay. not losing any sleep. <laughs> no, he's dying. <laughs> but Kathy wasn't at Bay Networks because it wasn't Bay Networks yet. And that was after the Synoptics merger. She right. was at yeah. Wellfleet. Yeah. She was at Wellfleet. But okay. And that's an even worse nightmare. Wellfleet and <laughs> Okay. Bad. Okay. So now, now the experiment that Van was working with, he needed to move a very large amount of data across ESnet to um, Pittsburgh Supercomputer Center, I believe. And what he had set up with ESnet was that it, if he could mark his traffic in some certain way, you know, whatever the way was, they would guarantee that he got 10 megabits of bandwidth in the network. Now his solution for ensuring that he only used 10 megabits was that he added a second interface card to his son workstation. He now had 100 megabits, which was fast uh, for, for any normal purposes, but for exactly this traffic, he had a 10 megabit interface. And with a 10 megabit ethernet interface, he could guarantee that he would never use more than 10 megabits of ESnet's bandwidth. Uh, and you know, it, he had it marked traffic appropriately and you know, send, send the data off to Pittsburgh Supercomputer Center. And they started thinking that, now wait a second, there's got to be a way to describe this so that other people can use the technology. Um, and so, so they described the architecture for doing that in this paper. They brought it to the IETF and Kathy and Brian Carpenter then became chairs of the Differentiated Services Working Group. And we uh, developed an architecture that is now widely used in the internet to do essentially that. And, and I, I've heard people say that, um, that, that they think the IETF is fair because of what happened in the differentiated services working group. We had the chair, Kathleen Nichols, who worked for Cisco, uh, a researcher, Van Jacobson, who worked for Cisco, and some random idiot named Fred Baker, uh, who worked for Cisco, standing at a mic arguing about what this architecture should do. Um, and you know, they, they saw us debate among ourselves and said, okay, this is, this is for real. This isn't Cisco coming out and doing something. This is people really trying to solve a problem. Um, and so, okay, we tried to solve a problem. Um, and that resulted in this document, which is RFC 2475, which is actually in part derivative from the two-bit model, but it describes how one would use a differentiated services code point to identify a class of traffic and say, okay, for this class of traffic, we're gonna use red. Uh, we're going to assign it a certain bandwidth. Uh, and is that exactly a certain amount of bandwidth or is that the minimum that might be given or is there a maximum for this class of traffic? You know, are, are we now going to shape the traffic down? Um, you know, we're, we, you know, we're looking at all of these different aspects of it. Um, and you know, so we came up with this document and a related document, and that's the wrong thing. I clicked the wrong button. Um, related document describing the, diff, the DSCP itself and how we expected it to be used. There are, of course, a whole lot more things that, that went on. Uh, I think there's 55 or 60 RFCs that relate to differentiated services and how it's used and, uh, really? and, and that then kind Yeah, so. and then diff serve leads to EXP bits and MPLS and lots of other things in the longer right. term that have right. come out of this. So, so we're actually using this architecture in MPLS with, yeah. with the EXP bits. 
Yeah. And, and now we're doing all the stuff with VXLAN as well, transferring the DSCP bits back to the VXLAN header and stuff like that to give you differentiated services, even in something like a data center fabric overlay. So it's fairly interesting that it all developed from a problem with TCP in a terminal server way, yep. way back. Yep. But yeah, so I mean, this is basically a group of people that didn't necessarily even know each other but sharing papers and reading documents, requests for comments. Um, and, and, and look at the date on that. That's December 1998. So right. for the last, what, 16 years or uh, whatever it is, 17, 18 years. 19. You know, 19. All right, I can't Almost 20, Russ. Almost <laughs> 20. <laughs> Th thanks so much for your support with my math skills. <laughs> you too. Um, maybe I shouldn't be homeschooling my daughters. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> um, you know, the, the, this, this work is really much older than people might think it is. This is, you know, fairly, fairly young in the ITF, in the world of the ITF and stuff like that. So it's kind of cool. And well, there's an, yeah. uh, there's an 06. And so then in 2006, uh, two guys from Nortel who aren't around and some guy named Baker, went around and talked with people and said, so how are you actually using this architecture? And went on to describe, so this is, you know, everyone we talked to, this is how they say they're using it. Uh, we do active queue management, we manage rates, we treat condition traffic in interesting ways. And um, we use admission control when it's appropriate. Um, and so then, you know, the, the different classes of traffic that we see people using wind up having different sets of characteristics like this. Um, and, you know, this actually has been an important guideline. I won't say it's universally used, but it is, it, it's out there. Um, and, and, and we go on from there. Yeah, that's really cool. So is that the end of your history there, Fred, or we have Yeah, more? yeah, I mean, if you have questions, I can answer them, but uh, I've been involved a little bit here and there. Uh, cool, so from a queuing perspective, um, on the router side, of course you have DSCP and then you have different queuing mechanisms that are used. And there is also a history behind those queuing mechanisms. And even the way TCP does stuff, the way TCP does slow start, there are various slow start mechanisms and algorithms, and there's different theories about why you do different things in TCP slow start. Like, are you trying to account for congestion, or are you trying to account for packet loss or jitter or delay? And you know, what's more important? So for instance, Google Quick uses Speedy, which makes a different set of assumptions about the network and network conditions than say, original um, earlier versions of slow start might use or something like that. So it's, well, it's yeah. So so what Van was working with in 1988 was a network that was built out of 56 kilobit lines. Now understand that in 1988 we thought those were fast, um, and they they. <laughs> Ivan still, still thinks they're fast. Yeah, Ivan still thinks they're fast. And I don't know. Donald might still have that speed in his lab. It, it's you know it's questionable. So in in 1988, I had an entire company behind a single 9.6 line. <laughs> okay, uh, that that's the way it works. Um, and so, for what Van was working with, the the question was: Let's assume that I can't use very much. I, I, uh, I I'm going to be fighting with everybody, and everybody's already using as much as they can, and I'm worming my way in. Uh, now, if you look at Google's most recent uh, recommendation on the initial window, they're saying, eh, "Hey, let's start out with ten packets." Right. and work from there um, because in a data center in modern telecommunication environment i'm generally talking about gigabits and yes i'm still worming my way in but there's room to do that right. um, so the world has changed the world, world and, has changed. and the applications have changed i mean in the old days you were talking about terminal servers and ftp and you know stuff, stuff like that where if it took a few seconds for the little green screen to pop up you know what you you were typing well it was a little irritating but it was okay today people are doing video like they're streaming this or whatever jitter and delay are a huge deal now and so now you know you start rethinking the way that you do the queuing 
to work better for those types of things, it seems. So, so you know, there's still absolutely, ongoing research. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, now in, in 1981, I was trying to convince my company, Control Data, that it should put a 9.6 terminal, an H19, on my desk. And the standard terminal at CDC was a 300 baud terminal. And I had to go take a typing test to prove that it was okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Does that mean you proved and, and you, you can proved you can type faster than 300 baud is that what that means <laughs> uh, well and the thing we were trying to convince management of was that the speed was not so i could talk to the computer it was so the computer could talk to me um you know, the computer can talk fastly faster than and bot it, it sounds like the earth is flat argument, right? Like what's the center of the universe? Is the user the center of the universe or is the machine the center of the universe? And, and, and that almost sounds like that's the argument you were having. Yeah, pretty much. Pretty strange. Pretty much. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. and the thing was that we had papers that were being written by people at IBM and other places that uh, uh, what they were looking at was SNA and SDLC and the behavior of 3270 terminal networks. And they observed, they were able to measure that the thought processes of a human being using that kind of a network would slow down to whatever rate the computer could talk with them at. And, and we kind of said, so how fast do you want me to work? Put me on a slow line, I'll think slow. <laughs> Yeah, Brad. So my first job in the computer world, I mean, beyond just building things on my own and using a Coco 2 and stuff like that was installing TN3270 cards and Z100. So it's, you're taking me way back there. <laughs> well, yeah, this is the Wayback Machine, but that's the title you gave the series, right? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so that's cool. Good. Excellent. All right, so questions? Anybody have any questions? Are we, so, uh, I guess one thing I'm kind of curious about, is there anything you would do different in retrospect? Well, yeah, I'd start out at the end point instead of the beginning. <laughs> uh, I mean, for, for, for all of this, this was a learning experience, and we made a vast number of mistakes. Um, and, and that's kind of the story of the internet. It's, we try harder and we make mistakes and we, we try to figure out the best bet, but at some point we have to try it out and see if it works. Um, and some things worked and some things didn't. Yeah, running code and rough consensus. Pretty right? much. Yeah, Pretty much. That's kind of cool. Good. Excellent. All right, any questions, Yvonne? No, I, no. I, well, not, not really questions, but just like observations that I think those of us who are coming into the industry um, have this idea that there are people out there who have it all figured out. Um, and I think it's important to say nobody ever has it all figured out. And we're all still, regardless of what level we're at, <laughs> to trying to figure out what's next and to solve problems. And we're throwing a lot of stuff against the wall to see what sticks. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, that's a great observation. you know. All right, cool. Well, I guess we can wrap up for this show and um, we'll hopefully see you next time on the next history of the internet or whatever we're calling this. I don't think we've actually uh, come up with an official name, but it's cool. Maybe we'll just call it the hysterical internet. That's the, <laughs> there we go. oh, sorry, historical internet. Sorry. I don't know, whatever it is, but that's cool. All right. Well, thanks, Fred. Thanks for your time. And hopefully we'll have you back on to talk about some other technologies that you were involved in and other parts of the internet that you were involved with over time. Cool. Thanks Sounds a lot. Good. Thanks, yeah. Thanks, everybody.